Welcome back to this week's episode of The Emily Show. I'm a little raspy because I'm recording on the tales of a very busy BravoCon weekend, which is also why this episode will likely be just a smidge late. Thank you for your patience. Y'all are always so good when we have to bump by a day to accommodate me. So thank you. It was fantastic. I'll be talking about it more in our member spaces and on a live stream. It was a lot of fun. But going from the glittery, glittery Bravo celebrities to talking about the dark side of Hollywood today with really Hollywood facing some massive trials. Um, Weinstein, Masterson, and Spacey all on trial at the same time, all related to sexual assault. I'm going to just let you know at the outset, I'm not going to be getting into the details of the charges at this point. We're going to do an overview of where we are with these cases, where these cases are being charged, what's going on with the trials without getting deeply um, and detailed into the allegations here. May we have to do that in the future as we talk about testimony? Yes. For today, we are taking kind of an overview of these three cases so that you have the footing you need as I'm sure the reporting of these cases is going to ramp up now that they are underway. Um, and they, I'm going to tell you the stage everything's at, what we're looking at, and then go from there. So just a trigger warning, the subject matter of these cases all regard sexual assault. Um, because I podcast and put content on YouTube, I will be very mindful with my words. Some of them are a little difficult for YouTube. The podcast is so lovely because Apple's like, you're, you know, say what you're saying. You're in a news category. Like, it's fine. I wish, I wish that YouTube would allow me to just flag my channel also as entertainment news so that I don't get binged on saying certain words that very much come up in this trial. But that's a conversation for another day and to be had with the YouTubes. But because we're dual platform, we try to be mindful of the topics. But they're important topics and they need to be talked about. So today we're going to talk about it. So let's roll the intro and start talking about these trials. It's it's kind of wild that they're all going at the same time and two of them in the same courthouse. So it's it's going to be a busy, It's these trials are going to be very busy. Um, and we're just, we're going to talk about them. Hey there, welcome to The Emily Show. I'm your host, Emily D. Baker, badass lawyer and everyone's favorite legal commentator, breaking down the legal shit in the news and pop culture stories you want to talk about. I've been a licensed attorney for over 15 years. I'm a former prosecutor, and I'm a big fan of the cursey words. So let's break it down. A big thank you to this segment's sponsor, Bright Sellers. I am so happy that Bright Sellers reached out. Something I don't talk about a lot is that I really don't branch out with wine or much else because I just don't have the mental capacity to pick new things. I love trying new things, but I just need someone to tell me. Bright Sellers makes that so easy because you take a quiz about your taste and they will help customize a box to you. And it's the perfect way to seem like a wine smarty pants with their wine education cards that come with each bottle. I'm really excited to try this gorgeous bottle of rosé. I don't care that it's fall. Rosé all day, all year also comes with this incredible card so you can see not just what the wine's going to taste like, the region that it's from, and get a full breakdown on perfect pairings. This suggests strawberries and mascarpone cheese and climbing up on the roof to watch the clouds. These cards are great. Thank you again, Bright Sellers, for giving our listeners a limited time offer of 50% off your first six bottle box. Click the link in the description to get started or just go to brightsellers.com slash lawnard. Let's get back to today's episode. Today we are starting talking about the Weinstein trial. It is still in jury selection. So they are still picking a panel of jurors to sit in this case. I expect that this will take a bit of time. The attorneys in this case are telling the court that it's going to take until around October 23rd, so sometime next week, before they get to opening arguments. And I'm not surprised that this is taking longer than like the Masterson jury selection. I think that Weinstein and the Weinstein scandal 
is more well known. I think when everything happened with Me Too, Weinstein ended up becoming the face of that just because of how many women came forward um, to talk about Harvey Weinstein. So I think that's why jury selection is going to take a little bit longer with Weinstein than with some of these other cases. Um, and I will say I did work with the DA on Weinstein, but we have not chatted, well, in years because I left the DA's office, but we have not chatted about this case. So I just wanted to make that clear. This is all coming from reporting coming out from those in the courtroom, which is always so frustrating. LA County, look, can we just have a chat like me and all of LA County? Can we just have a chat, please? Can we please get the audio recorded or audio um, access program back up or or cameras in the courtroom? It's important. And I know and I I know that these cases are sensitive. Um, but it's important. And I worry that after the Amber Heard and Johnny Depp trial, you are going to see particularly victims much more reticent to be on film for fear that they're going to be picked apart. I hope that what they realize is that they are in a much different position than Amber Heard and and I hope would be treated as such, but it's difficult. And in um, the Masterson trial, the victims are going by initials. So victim identity and protecting victim identity is a little bit different there. But I also think there's a way to do that. You can get a camera in the courtroom and not show juror faces. You could also do audio only. I'm just saying the public would love to have access to their courts in a safe way and to have transparency in our system and, and how that's going. Anyway, I'm off my soapbox. We should actually talk about Weinstein. So Weinstein previously went through a trial in New York. He did not testify in that criminal trial. He was sentenced to 23 years in prison. He was convicted of a first degree sex act and third degree rape in that case. He was acquitted of predatory sexual assault with two victims and a first degree rape. That was the New York case. So the New York case is being appealed we will talk about that when the appellate stuff comes out, if that's something that you're interested in as a collective law nerd audience. Those uh, victims and those charges are separate than these. I got asked a couple times by uh, more traditional media outlets, if he's already been sentenced to 23 years at his age, why go ahead and prosecute the case? Why are the taxpayers in LA spending for this high profile trial? Well, there are five different women in Los Angeles. There are 11 charges against him, and it's a different jurisdiction. And just because he's already been convicted in one place doesn't mean there won't be things on appeal, doesn't mean um, that the victims in this case don't deserve to have their day in court too. So even though the practical matter is that 23 years will likely keep him in prison for the rest of his life, being heard is an important part of this too. And we're going to see in LA five um, victims testify in the case and five other accusers will also testify in the case. In California, that's under 1108. Different jurisdictions have different names for the rules that allow an exception to the rules of evidence where you can get prior bad acts. Normally, you can't just go in and be like, well, they did it before, so they did it now. That's not the case in sex cases, and a few other types of things. You can bring in evidence to show that there's a pattern. And so this has been much litigated pre-trial, and there will be five others who will also testify to show that pattern, but they are not charged as a victim. So it's not um, where it's going to a particular count that's going to add more time at sentencing. So that's what is kind of the underlying footing of the Weinstein case, and that is in jury selection. What's been popping off in court lately, we saw that the governor of California's wife came forward and said that she is one of those that will be testifying. And that was a very interesting disclosure. And they've been fighting in court over pretrial litigation with regard to Governor Newsom's wife testifying and some of the evidence that may or may not come up, what, what that looks like in relation to this trial. So we're going to talk about that for a moment. 
The first uh, article that I'm looking at is coming to us from Deadline. Harvey Weinstein to claim consensual affair with Jennifer Newsom in L.A. rape trial defense. And it goes on to say Harvey Weinstein's lawyer plans to argue that the imprisoned producer did not sexually assault Jennifer Newsom nearly 20 years ago, but instead had consensual sex with California's now first partner. In a motions hearing on Monday in downtown Los Angeles ahead of the criminal trial, lawyers for the defense and the district attorney's office, it says we're at loggerheads. <laughs> We're at odds over the inclusion of a 2007 correspondence between Newsom and Weinstein over the revelations of an affair Gavin Newsom had with an aide while the mayor of San Francisco. So we can already see how the defense might spin this either as like a retaliatory affair or what have you. Um, but the governor's affair, I don't even remember any of this. Did I follow it closely? Did this, did we know this? I don't know. I don't, I truly do not follow that that closely. Um, but clearly it must have come up at the time, I would imagine, because uh, nobody seems to be talking about it now. So I imagine it's the topic has been exhausted. The article goes on to say, citing bad press fallout from the affair, the email from then Jennifer Seibel came about two years after Weinstein allegedly assaulted the actress filmmaker in an LA area hotel room with the soon-to-be First Lady of San Francisco calling the wife of Newsom's campaign manager the one to blame for the affair. The email to Weinstein came soon after she had started dating Newsom, she being his now wife. The couple would marry in 2008. Newsom became California's lieutenant governor, serving 2011 to 19, was sworn in as the state's 40th governor in 2019. Quote, of all the things you'd think a woman that is raped by Harvey Weinstein wouldn't do, it's ask him how to deal with a sex scandal, end quote, from defense lawyer Mark Worksman, um, which he argued in court Monday morning. Quote, the fact that she comes to Mr. Weinstein for that advice indicates the friendship and companionship of Jane Doe number four and Mr. Weinstein. The defense will be that they had an affair and had consensual sex. This comes up quite a lot in sexual assault cases. The, the defense is its consent. It's like when you're looking at a defamation case. The defense is that it's not defamation, it's opinion or it's parody or it's true. And this is a, a very common defense. The article continues, long identified as Jane Doe number four in court documents, uh, Newsom went public last week with her role in the high profile West Coast trial, which is anticipated to last until the end of the year. Yeah. Yeah, the end of December. It, it's October. She intends to testify at his trial in order to seek some measure of justice for survivors and as a part of her life's work to improve the lives of women, her attorney said. Well, she, she should be seeking justice for herself. Making this about all people or all women or all things is not good. Um, and it's really not the point of these trials. It's about her, truly. Uh, the attorney also said, please respect her choice not to discuss this matter outside of the courtroom. Well, she's pen she's pending as a witness while jury selection's going on. I'm sorry, she's pending as a victim while jury selection's going on. She can't discuss this matter outside of the courtroom or very, very much shouldn't um, without potentially compromising the trial. So I I think everyone is it has to respect it and I don't think anybody wouldn't. It said, uh, Mrs. Newsom brought up her experience with the much accused Pulp Fiction producer in a 2017 article soon after the publication of the New York Times expose detailing Weinstein's decades of vile behavior. As a litany of motions whipped through the docket, they certainly were discussing Seibel Newsom at the Clara short. I don't know why this sentence was necessary in this article. In the session Monday that Los Angeles Superior Judge Lisa Lynch called sometimes very dramatic, the judge eventually ruled that the 2007 email can be entered into the case. The article says sort of. I would say in part. Hearing the objections from Assistant DA Marlene Martinez over including the correspondence and, the, and grilling Newsom over it, Lynch told the court, well, this sentence is confusing. Did the DA tell the court this or did the judge tell the attorneys this? The judge told the attorneys, essentially, I'm not going to allow it 
Mr. Worksman, if you want to ask him whether she sought his advice over a situation with the press, that's fine. She added that, in her opinion, the gist of the email was too tangential in relation to this trial. So asking about whether or not she, the victim, Jane Doe 4, sought his advice, yes, but letting in the physical email and the contents thereof, no, is what this sounds like to me from reporting, which is why it's so hard when you can't see what's going on in court. Various texts and tweets sought by both sides from Newsom, including one about former first daughter Melania Obama's chances of being assaulted during her internship at the Weinstein Company were rejected by the judge. I don't know how any of that would be relevant. I've heard nothing about that until I started going through this article today. Um, I did not I didn't even realize that Malia Obama had worked at the Weinstein Company, but wow, just I, I can understand why some attorneys might want to bring it up. But I don't see how it's relevant to this trial unless it's to show that this victim and Weinstein still had a collegial relationship. I don't know. I don't know what the point would be, but the judge said no. If the door gets opened for it, I'm sure we'll see it reported that it came up. Uh, DA Martinez also sought to exclude anything that was political because the case has nothing to do with politics. And the defense said, quote, Your Honor, surely you're not suggesting that the defense can't question Jane Doe 4 over her solicitation of donations for her boyfriend from Mr. Weinstein. The judge pointed out that to all present, that part of the questionnaire for the potential jurors mentions Newsom and his political stances, and that could prove problematic. The defense promised they would avoid the topic in talking to likely jurors, which seemed to satisfy the DA's office for now. It goes on to uh, talk about what Weinstein is facing. We've already talked about that in this uh, episode. So they're anticipating jury selection going through next week, October 23rd, and then opening statements taking place after that. These high-profile cases tend to take longer, but also... One of the saddest things about doing jury selection in sexual assault cases is how many jurors have direct and personal um, either assaults of their own family members, but direct and personal connection to the types of crime charge. So jury selection just takes a little bit longer. It really is one of the things that I found most shocking was how many um how many people had had those experiences um and if that's if you're listening and that is you don't ever feel alone because you are not alone it's just it's one it's one of those things in our society and i i am not going to tangent more but it is one of those things where it is difficult to talk about people don't want to talk about it but when you see cases like this we need to talk about how many how many people, especially with Weinstein, how many people were impacted, and then how many people in our population are impacted. It's 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 truly a bit staggering, and that's one of the things that's going to slow down jury selection because they have to question those jurors privately um, about whether they can still be fair in this case, given their own experiences. And some will be able to, and some will not be able to. And as long as they tell the court the truth about whether they can or cannot, then that's fair because that's their experience. And so until jury selection is done, unless there are more pretrial hearings in court, there really shouldn't be that much more from this case until early next week when we get into opening statements. But the case that has already had its opening statements is the Masterson trial. And we're going to talk about that next. Thank you to Green Chef for sponsoring this episode of The Emily Show. I've been traveling a bunch, and there is something so nice about knowing that I don't have to go to the grocery store when I get home because my Green Chef meals are being delivered to my house. They work for the entire family. They are meals tailored to fit any eating lifestyle, including paleo, keto, vegan, vegetarian, gluten-free, 
and they're delicious. Last night we had a fantastic blackened chicken with cauliflower grits and a really good like coleslaw type salad. It was delicious. It was easy and it was ready to be done, which when you get off a plane is exactly what you need. But if your everyday is as busy as mine is, why not just have delicious meals delivered to your door that can be ready in 30 minutes? They have 30 menu options to pick from every week, tons of organic options, and the menu cards are so easy that even my 14-year-old can make our dinners, which has been a huge help. If you're ready to find out why Green Chef is the number one meal kit for eating well, please support the show and use my link that's down below in the description, or just go to greenchef.com slash emilybaker135. Use code emilybaker135 to get $135 off across five boxes and your first box ships free. That's greenchef.com slash emilybaker135. Let me know what meals are your favorite. Now let's get back to today's episode. It's a heavy one. The Danny Masterson trial is also a felony criminal trial taking place in downtown Los Angeles in the same courthouse as Harvey Weinstein. I believe these two judges are on the same floor um, with one another, but either way, they are both downtown in the uh, Short Ridge Fultz Criminal Justice Center right there in downtown LA. Um, Those elevators, man, always a mess. Always a mess, those elevators. On Tuesday, October 18th, which is also the same day I'm recording this, I told you it was going to be a little late, they had the end of jury selection and opening arguments and began questioning witnesses. For a little bit of background, if you're not familiar with this case, Danny Masterson was an actor um, most well-known for that 70s show, is facing three charges of forcible rape and is a member of the Church of Scientology. All three victims were, at the time, members of the Church of Scientology. The fact that they are all part of the church, while normally something that wouldn't much come up in a criminal trial like this, has quite been the center of attention in this case because the DAs are seeking to use it to explain the behavior of the victims, which needs to be explained because they were told, or at least the victim that testified today, was told by the church not to report to police. There are reasons that these victims did not go to the authorities, and a lot of that has to do with the church community. So while the religion and the church is not on trial, the culture goes a long way in explaining the behavior of women because these are older allegations, and a jury will always have a few that will say, well, why didn't they say anything? And the DAs are going to have to address why that is. And in this case, it's because, or the DAs are saying that it's because of the church. And so it is going to become a big part of this case. We're going to look at two different ports. Again, no cameras in the courtroom. We are relying on reporting. I think it will be interesting to see um, how much Scientology plays into this because for the defense, they're going to want to kind of step away from it. Look, this isn't religion on trial. This isn't Scientology on trial. Whether you don't like Scientology or believe whatever about it or have a low opinion of it, that's not the point here. The point is, did this person do these things or were these encounters consensual? That's going to be, I think, the way the defense goes. The prosecution is going to go, look, we're also not putting the church on trial, but the things that were said to these women and the pressure that they were under is the reason for their behavior, because as unfortunate as it is, you always have to explain that to a jury because people have their own kind of preconceived notions of, well, if something bad happened, why didn't you do this? And that is something that prosecutors have to be mindful of in not just sexual assault cases, but in all cases, you have to explain why people did the things that they did. The first report we're going to is from the Associated Press. Um, A prosecutor on Tuesday described rape allegations by three women against that 70s show actor Danny Masterson from two decades ago that contained some of the same disturbing elements, which talked about women becoming woozy um, and 
being in and around the hot tub. And I will attach this article to the episode if you want to read it. It gets into a bit more detail because they're talking about um, DA Mueller's opening statements. And we'll go through what went down in opening statements because they did get a bit fiery. So we will go through opening statements without all of the details because I did tell you at the beginning I was going to do the best I could to go through this without all of the details so you could listen to this and understand what's going on and hopefully not have this be tremendously triggering. Masterson's lawyer said the reason the allegations had so much in common is that the alleged victims violated the detective's warning not to speak with each other and had quote-unquote cross-pollinated their accounts and undermined their credibility. Quote, if you speak to each other, you will contaminate this case, end quote. They were told, defense attorney Philip Cohen said in court, quote, speaking to each other and other witnesses is fatal to a case, end quote. Masterson 46 pled not guilty to the three counts that occurred between 2001 and 2003 in his Hollywood home, which functioned as a social hub when he was at the height of his fame. The defense attorney urged jurors not to consider Masterson's affiliation with the Church of Scientology and its relationship to this case, while Mueller said that it helped explain why the women, all former members of the church, waited so long to report the incidents. And I think that's exactly right on both accounts. I think that's exactly, I think that's, I think that makes the most sense from a defense standpoint, and I think that most makes the most sense from the prosecution standpoint. You have to explain. The article goes on to say two of the alleged victims first went to the church to report what happened to them and were told it wasn't rape and that reporting it to the authorities or telling others about it would end um, with them being ostracized by their closest friends and even family members. Quote, you essentially become an enemy of the church, Mueller said. You lose it all. Um... And that's my understanding as well. You lose your community, you lose your friends, you lose your family, you lose everything and are turned out. The judge, Olmato, sternly reminded the lawyers that Scientology would not dominate the trial. The trial's witness list is full of members and former members of the church, which has a strong presence in Los Angeles and has counted many famous figures among its members. The list includes former member Lisa Marie Presley, the daughter of Elvis Presley, and the former wife of Michael Jackson, a friend of one of the alleged victims. One of the women had been Masterson's longtime girlfriend. Another was best friends with his personal assistant. A third, an actress, was a newer acquaintance. Cohen, the defense attorney, said that the heart of the defense was a, quote, sizzle reel of inconsistencies between what the women initially said and how their accounts changed over time. And the next article we're going to go through also comes from Deadline and goes through a little bit more of what was said during opening statements. And I appreciate how much Deadline has been updating um, their stories. So we're going to we're going to start at the bottom and work our way back up to the latest update because this the, they update their articles as the trial is going, which I've found to be very, very helpful. They talk about the fact that D.A. Mueller pointed out that this was three different sexual assault cases and there are three different charges, one for each um, alleged victim and one for each incident. They then say that with mere minutes to go before the lunch break, after the DA had completed the opening statement, the defense attorney got up and gave an indication of the hard tone this trial could take on. The attorney leapt up to give a couple of highlights of their argument, how the alleged victims disregarded the advice of LAPD and then communicated with one another and how there was a shakedown um, at play because Masterson made oodles and oodles of money on that 70s show. That was a direct, the oodles was a direct quote. There very quickly were a number of objections from Mueller, the DA, and others at the prosecution table as Cohn became more and more aggressive. A frustrated Judge Elmato called the parties to the bench and could be heard telling them essentially to dial it down. Quote, this case will also be about certain policies that each of these alleged victims understood they needed to follow, Mueller said earlier in the day about the Church of Scientology. Quote, they acted in certain ways, they engaged in certain behavior, and they made certain choices based on certain policies. The DA went on to describe the role of Scientology in Masterson's life and case. As the prosecutor spoke late Tuesday morning, the alleged victims' faces were displayed on a video monitor at the far south, far south end of the courtroom. And then they went in to describe the um, the different 
crimes that are alleged here and talk about what happened with each of the women. And again, I will attach these articles if you want to read into them in more detail. In the opening, it was said that alleged victim Jen B's immediate Scientology supervisor told her, quote, if you are going to tell me this is rape, it is not rape, when she went to them to talk about the matter. Mueller said, quote, in fact, you are not even allowed to say the word rape. You are not allowed to go to the police or anyone. This is going to be, this is me, sorry, not, not the article. This is me for the, for the audio audience. This is why the Church of Scientology is going to come up so much in this trial, because of situations like that, not just going and disclosing to someone who's like, that's not what this is, you're not going anywhere, but also the culture around truly losing your friend group, your family, your support, your church, your everything, if you go against what you are told. So that context matters very much and will matter very much in this trial. In the opening, they went through that on June 6, 2006, Jen B. went to the Hollywood LAPD station to tell what had happened to her. Very soon afterwards, at a meeting at her parents' house, she was pressured to sign a non-disclosure agreement and drop the matter or be excommunicated from the church. She signed the document from uh, for the Scientology lawyer, allegedly in her parents' living room, and a series of payments followed as the police case withered. Looking at the reporting from after lunch from the defense opening statements, the defense attorney told the jury that this case is about three women who are going to tell you about three nights almost 20 years ago. Quote, this other stuff, this other stuff is truly the elephant in the room, the defense added, trying to sweep away the details and descriptions of Scientology. After the defense's often curt opening statement, the first witness to take the stand was the first alleged victim, Jen B. They report how she talks about meeting um, Masterson and about what the Church of Scientology is like. She said that she first met Masterson at a softball game and other church events, and that she had a close friendship with Bree Schaefer, Masterson's then personal assistant, that she had cordial interactions with Masterson in their increasingly overlapping circle of friends, including Lisa Presley. Accuser Jen B. called the then Scientologist and daughter of Elvis the witness, um, oh, sorry, Lisa Presley, as the accuser called the then Scientologist, and the witness laid out a very close-knit community linked by the church. At this juncture in the testimony, the judge read out a statement that Jen B.'s description of Scientology was not offered for the truth and were her opinion. The witness, I, I don't know why the article switched between alleged victim and witness, but Jen B. said that it was, or testified more appropriately, that it was frowned upon to fraternize with the enemy, the enemy being people outside of Scientology. Quote, you can be reported for associating with those outside of Scientology unless you bring them into the group. She testified that Masterson uh, stared at her intently, occasionally sipping a beverage, and that's an interesting thing that he was just staring at her while she was testifying. I mean, that's not uncommon. After the jury exited for the afternoon, a very annoyed Judge Almato sternly told the prosecution that she would not tolerate this becoming a trial about Scientology per her rulings of earlier in the matter. Going to the reporting from the end of the day, the defense has already requested a mistrial based on how Scientology has been referenced so far. The request was denied by Judge Almato, this is going to be a long and contentious trial just based on how this first day of opening statements and one witness has popped off. Um, the article says, after a long and contentious day of opening statements at the very end of the day's hearing, lawyers for the defense and the DA's office faced off in front of the judge about the role of the Church of Scientology in the case. With the organization obviously at the core of the prosecution's case, the defense attorney said he had no understanding of the nexus or purpose of the apology policies of the church being brought up in the trial. Quote, the jury has been told Masterson and his religion look down significantly on those who are not members of the church or members of Scientology, the defense argued. 
also adding that such a policy is not the official stance of the church. The judge previously had admonished the prosecution earlier this month and today about her concerns over pushing the boundaries of how much Scientology could be brought up, saying, quote, anyone's beliefs are going to be rooted in something. The judge said today that there were some instances of context that can be admitted into the trial, but that she was disappointed with how things have gone on the first day before the jury. That's not good, by the way, for the prosecution. The article goes on to say, certain to be a factor throughout the remaining weeks of trial, the introduction of the sometimes controversial Church of Scientology are ingrained in the proceedings and the role um, and its role could be part of any Masterson appeal if necessary. Quote, I'm not sure what you are asking the court to do now, Judge Olmedo exclaimed, noting that the defense had asked for a mistrial in previous weeks, denying the latest request for a mistrial the judge wasn't too pleased with assistant DA Reinhold Mueller's explanation that he repeatedly referenced Scientology to lay foundation for the relationships and context the alleged victims, all of whom were members of the church at one point, lived with. That's troubling, the defense replied. Ultimately, the judge told the DA's office to walk a more circumspect line with emphasis on relevance. So, we are going to get a lot of pushback between the judge, the DA, and the defense on how much context is enough context. And the defense seems to be worried that, well, the prosecution saying that Masterson just looks down on everyone that's not a Scientologist. I wonder if they are worried that that includes the jurors. Like, oh, we're just telling them the defendant thinks all of you are the enemy. Great. And I wonder if that's the concern here. But before we wrap today's episode, we do need to take a look at the Spacey trial. So let's talk about that case real quick. Unlike the other two trials that we've talked about, which are both criminal trials happening in Los Angeles, the Spacey case is a civil trial happening in the Southern District of New York. So we have a very different type of trial going on with actor Kevin Spacey, but the allegations are also those of sexual assault. The complaint in this case was originally filed in state court. It then got removed to federal court through a lot of legal that we are not getting into today because this was supposed to be an overview, and I've already been talking for quite a long time. But this was originally filed on September 9th, 2020. It's in trial now. It was originally filed with two plaintiffs, and Kevin Spacey is the defendant. One of those plaintiffs is no longer in the case, so it is just going to trial between actor Anthony Rapp and Kevin Spacey. The claims in this case are for assault, battery, and then for intentional infliction of emotional distress. So those are what we saw in civil lawsuits with regards to other assault cases like with uh, Virginia uh, Jufre and Jeffrey Epstein. So we saw these similar types of civil charges. And in fact, the Spacey judge is the same judge that handled that case. But unlike the other two cases, this one is much further along in trial. We are already into the defense case. Um, on October 17th, Kevin Spacey testified coming, the reporting is coming from Law 360 that a tearful Kevin Spacey tells a jury he never assaulted the actor. And again, um, Anthony Rapp is accusing Kevin Spacey of assaulting him when he was 14 years old and Spacey was 26 back in 1986. Spacey said, quote, I knew I had never been alone with Anthony Rapp, so I had no idea how this could possibly be true. What I knew wasn't true was that I, this is a direct quote from the article and it's an awkward sentence. Quote, what I knew wasn't true was that I ever had any sexual interest in Anthony Rapp or any child. That I knew. Oh, this is why it's so hard when there's no cameras. The words in writing are much harder to understand than when you get the tone and the cadence. Spacey testified that he issued a public apology to Rapp due to intense pressure from his publicists. The Academy Award-winning actor who was dropped from House of Cards and other projects following assault 
allegations from Rapp and others said he regretted this decision within minutes. Quote, I've learned a lesson, and that is never apologize for something you didn't do, Spacey said. He also grew emotional as he explained that he came out as gay in the apology because he wanted to, quote, do something positive with the attention. Instead, Spacey said the move was criticized as an attempt to change the subject. Quote, I would never have done anything to hurt the gay community, and I was so upset that that was what happened, Spacey testified through tears, dabbing his eyes with a tissue. Quote, it was really wrong, and it was really bad, and I am deeply sorry. Rap's lawyers are expe expected to cross-examine Spacey on Tuesday, which did happen. So it is Tuesday as I am recording and late uh, at that, but the reporting from Law 360 is already in that Spacey was confronted with shifting statements at this trial. S quote, Spacey took the stand for the second day in the civil trial before U.S. District Judge Lewis Kaplan. Rap, best known for originating the role of Mark Cohen in the Broadway hit show Rent, is accusing Spacey of assault in 1986 when he was 14 years old and Spacey was 26. Testifying on direct examination, Spacey said he was shocked when Rap came forward with the allegations in 2017. But during cross-examination, they focused on inconsistencies in Spacey's account. The attorney noted that during the deposition, Spacey said he first met Rap while sharing a drink with famed actor Jack Lemmon backstage at the Broadway show Long Day's Journey into the Night in 1986. Later, however, Spacey said Lemmon was sober at the time. I don't know if that's an inconsistency. I think you can share a drink with someone and still be sober. I think you can have a drink. I don't know how inconsistent that is. I need more context. Oh, no. I misunderstood as I was reading this. They didn't mean like he wasn't drunk at the time. They meant he did not drink at all at the time. Ha, I, I understand now. The article goes on to say, say Spacey responded that he realized his error following the deposition and quickly worked with counsel to correct the record, devastated to have mischaracterized Levin. So devastated to mischaracterize that he was in fact sober, like in recovery, not drinking ever at all, as opposed to not being inebriated. Raps, this is this is why, again, cameras everywhere. Rap's lawyer also picked apart Spacey's 2017 public apology. Spacey now says many portions of the statement were untrue, including that he had a lot of respect and admiration for Rap and was sorry for the actor's experience. Quote, one of the things you were thinking was, quote, if I apologize, even if it wasn't true, it might work out better for me, right? The attorney asked. Spacey replied, I don't know that that's what I was thinking, sir. He was then asked, what you wanted was to survive this and move on with your career, the attorney said. That's what you were concerned about, right? Spacey responded, I wanted to find out what was true. It's kind of an odd answer when you're being accused of assault. You should know what happened. So I wanted to find out what was true is a strange response. You should know what was true. And if what you wanted was to apologize so you could save your career, just say it. It's not going to get any worse than these allegations against you. That's an odd answer for me. Odd answer. I, I, I wonder if that will stick out to the jury. It stuck out enough to this reporter that that was, that was in here. But I wonder if that will stick out to the jury as well. Judge Kaplan grew visibly frustrated, it says, with the defense attorney during cross-examination repeatedly sustaining objections and at one point telling the attorney to cut it out with argumentative questions. The judge also curtailed a line of questionings about Spacey's Oscar-winning performance in the 1999 film American Beauty and the various sex act his character engaged in on screen. Right, because minors... Judge Kaplan said, I think we've had enough. Wow. Spacey stepped down from the witness stand Tuesday afternoon. The defense then called forensic psychologist Dr. Alexander Bardley, who countered earlier testimony that Rapp has post-traumatic stress disorder and said the actor exhibits some traits of narcissistic personality disorder. 
The trial is expected to wrap this week with closing arguments tentatively scheduled for Thursday and jury deliberations to follow. So we might see jury um, a jury come back in this civil case either late this week or early next week. If you follow me on social media, I will be updating you on this. This is not the end of legal problems for Kevin Spacey, though. There are allegations against him in the UK that he will be facing in 2023 for trial, criminal allegations. Then there was also the $31 million arbitration settlement that he reached with regard to sexual harassment on the set of House of Cards. That was a case where, and we're not going to get into it much deeper, but that was a case that because of, I'm assuming, his contract with the show, it went directly to arbitration. Then they brought it to court to try to get around the arbitration award, and the judge was like, what we're not going to do, what we're not going to do is get around the arbitration award and or the arbitration award and the court upheld the arbitration award of over $31 million in that case. Um, so there is a long, long road ahead for Kevin Spacey, a very long road ahead for him. Um, this civil case is not the end of it. Again, he is facing that criminal case in the UK. We will absolutely be keeping an eye on what happens with this verdict. But it is, again, a civil case. It's hard. It's easy to conflate the three that are going on. But this is a case where he is being sued for $40 million for the assault, the battery, and the intentional infliction of emotional distress. Like we saw in the Johnny Depp Amber Heard case, we are going to see and have seen testimony of experts about things like PTSD because in this case, intentional infliction of emotional distress is at issue like it was in the Cardi B case. So you have to prove that there was emotional distress caused. And with that, I think we've given hopefully a helpful overview of what's going on in these three cases. Um, I know the media is looking at this as kind of the, the Me Too era of trials after the Me Too movement um, first kind of came to light and took over social media. And I, I think opened a lot of eyes about how many people have had unwanted um, sexual encounters, unwanted sexual advances, unwanted sexual touching, unwanted assaults, how many people have had um, these experiences and opened those conversations about Hollywood. Other industries have been opened up to those conversations as well. But we're seeing now these three trials with some of those cases. I think Weinstein being the biggest one because that was at the heart of the conversation um, back in 2017. And here we are now. The law and justice can take time. I will be following these cases. They are not televised, so I'm not going, obviously not going to be streaming them, but we will be following along with what the testimony is, and I will be updating during my live streams as we go what we're seeing day by day. I will attach the articles that are much more detailed than what I've covered here about the allegations. And as I said, Deadline and Law 360 have both been covering different cases very closely. Deadline's been covering the Masterson testimony very closely. Law 360's been covering Spacey very closely. And so those are resources you can go to as well. Thank you for being here. Thank you for putting up with my sort of very tired BravoCon voice. Um, it's, it's heavy trials right now, but important trials. And thank you always for having compassionate and kind discussion about this on the internet. It needs to be discussed. We need to talk about how these trials go forward, what the defenses are, the difficulties that victims face in cases like this, but also the difficulties that those accused face if they are accused wrongly. All of those discussions need to be had. And right now we're having them across the Depp trial to, you know, the Weinstein trial, the Masterson trial, and the Spacey trial. We're having those conversations, and we have these very, very different trials. The testimony that we saw in Depp is going to be very different, I think, than the testimony that we're seeing in Masterson and Spacey and Weinstein. And it's important to have the conversation that they are different um, and talk about why they are different, because 
with the how close in time they are, these trials really are on everyone's mind. And it really does remind us to have a conversation about all of it, really. I would love to have that conversation with you more in the comments. If this episode has left you with questions, I apologize because my brain is very tired and I am sure it was not as smooth as, as well as it normally is. So leave your questions in the comments. I will get to them as best I can so we can continue to have these conversations. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for being a law nerd. Say it with me. May your family be well. I've started in the wrong place. We're going with it today. May your Wi-Fi be strong. May your toilet paper be plentiful. May your voice be rested. And may the memes coming out of BravoCon delight you after this very heavy episode. May your family be well. And may the odds be ever in your favor. I will see you again next week. Connect with me everywhere. I'm at the Emily D. Baker. If you guys want to join the text, just text emily.com. If you want to join the channel, lawnerdsunite.com. Happy to have you support what we do here on the YouTube.